Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I want to start by rewriting the precise statement of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, because in the last lecture there was just a little bit of confusion about the statement. So, I tried to write a, um, a kind of cleaner statement, but let me write the precise statement here, because I think it's better to have it. So, the statement works in abstract measure spaces, so that's why I think it's better to write it. So we have M is a measure space. F, M to M, just needs to be a measurable map. And mu. F invariant probability measure. So then for every integrable function, mu integrable function phi, the limit exists. So this is the first part of the statement. So I'm just rewriting again Birkhoff's ergodic theorem because there was I did not write it in its full generality and I think it would have been a good idea to have it. So in a completely abstract measurable setting, we have not assumed ergodicity yet. Just the fact that f is invariant implies that this limit exists, which is in itself highly non-trivial. Right? This just means that if you look at the average value of phi along an orbit, it does converge to an average. Okay? Moreover, if mu is also ergodic, then this limit is exactly Uh, sorry, I should say for then the limit, then for every phi, the limit exists for mu almost, almost mu almost every x, of course. If mu is also ergodic, then the limit, and this should be 1 over n, sorry, okay, limit 1 over n, sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 phi integral fi of x is equal precisely to the integral of phi d mu for mu almost every x. So just to spend a couple of minutes on this, what is the difference between these two? And why do you need the additional ergodicity assumption to get the second statement? I'm not asking for a formal reason, but just intuitively. Can you see the differences? So this is the limit exists. This is saying that the limit is equal to very specific value. Why can this not be true if mu is not ergodic? Why can you not hope to have this be true if mu is not ergodic? Tal? You have some idea?
That's just for any invariant measure, that's true. That's the definition of invariance. Right? So for any invariant measure, f star mu equals mu, and this is true. Why can we not have this? Why do we need ergodicity for this? Any ideas? <laughs> so remember, what does non-ergodicity mean? So you have a, we have our measure here. Non-ergodicity means that mu can be, has two, at least two ergodic components, has several ergodic components, right? Mu is some kind of linear combination of various measures, okay? So there is a measure mu1 and a measure mu2, and some combination of these is equal to mu. Now, what does the point do? For ergodic measures, this, what uh, this theorem is really saying is that the distribution of the orbit of x inside this ergodic component is uniform with respect to this measure, right? Because the average value of phi, what is this? This is the average value of the function phi. Function phi can be, for example, the characteristic function of some, uh, of some set, or it can be a more general function. But what this is, this is doing is taking the orbit of x and is looking at the orbit of x and taking the average value of phi along the orbit. And what is this? You can think of the integral as the average value of phi also, in a different way, right? This is the average value of phi on your whole space with respect to this measure. So these are two different ways of taking the average value of phi, and this theorem says they, they coincide. And why do they coincide? Because the, this orbit is very uniformly distributed in your space. And therefore, if you take the average value of phi along the orbit, it will coincide with the average value of phi in your space because the orbit is, goes everywhere. It spends equal amounts of time everywhere with respect to this measure. OK, this is what it's saying. So this cannot, of course, work for if the measure is not ergodic because if you choose a point that belongs to this ergodic component, it will never land in here. Right? So there is no reason that this should converge to the average value of phi over the whole space, only with respect to the ergodic component to which it belongs. Okay, just to give you some feeling for this. So um, how was it that I wrote it in the last lecture? I wrote it a little bit differently. So if you remember, we have the basin of the measure mu is equal to the set of x such that 1 over n, the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1, converges to the integral of phi d mu for all phi continuous. And what I said, which is really the corollary of this, corollary, is that if m is a metric space, because we cannot even define a continuous function if it's not a metric space, right? So if m is a metric space, then mu of b mu equals 1. And what is the difference between these two statements? It's a very subtle difference. I will not give a rigorous proof, but just to, to mention this, I think it's useful. So in this statement, this set of points for which this holds may depend on the function phi, right? So the statement is that for every phi, this limit exists mu almost everywhere. It means that the set of points where it does not converge has zero measure, okay? But this actual set of zero measure might depend on the function phi, okay? So for each function phi, there's a different set of zero measure for which this holds, and the same thing here. What we would like, really, is to find a, uh, a set of full measure for which this convergence holds for all those points for every function. That's what we would like. And that is what we can get if we uh, look at the slightly stronger situation in which we're looking at the convergence with respect to continuous functions, which we can do if we're in a metric space. 
And in that case, what we're saying here is that there exists a set of full measure for which this convergence holds for every continuous functions. Okay? We cannot say that there exists a set of full measure such that this convergence, such that for that set, for this convergence holds for all L1 functions for every point in the set. Okay? It's a very delicate difference, but it's a difference that I thought I should mention. Okay. Yes. Sorry? You mean, why would we need to assume it's a metric space? Well, in two ways. First of all, just to define continuous functions. And second of all is because the argument that you use to show that you can take this intersection. So basically, you're taking some kind of uh, intersection of sets of full measure. You know, so you're taking the set of points for which this convergence, for each function, you get a set of full measure. And then you take some kind of intersection of all these sets of full measures for all the functions and so you use the fact that the continuous function have some dense um, countable subset of continuous functions and you can take the intersection of this of the full measure set for each of these countable subset yes do we need what uh, that is a good question, actually. I'm not 100% sure at this moment. I'd have to remind myself of the actual proof. Um, OK. Compact? Maybe. I don't think so. Yes, yes, I don't, yes, I don't remember exactly. I will look it up and I will let you know. That's a good question. I, I wasn't planning on giving you an actual proof of this following from this, so I just wanted to emphasize this very subtle point, which is that in this case, the set depends on the function, and in this case, we are able to find a set for which this convergence holds for all functions, and with continuous functions, it's easier to do that. Um, okay, so what we want to do now is we want to start applying this theorem. As I said last time, this is a really powerful theorem because what it says is that if you know the measure, you know this limit. Okay? So really it's saying if you know that a system has an ergodic invariant measure, you pretty much know at least the statistics of the dynamics for almost every point. You know that almost every point is distributed in space exactly according to that measure. So it's a very powerful theorem. It's a theorem from the 20s, and it's still one of the fundamental theorems of dynamics. The difficulty, therefore, is to show that a measure is ergodic. And this is highly non-trivial. And as I said, in certain cases, you don't even have an invariant measure to begin with. So you need to first find an invariant measure and then show it's ergodic. Okay? So what we're going to start with in the next couple of lectures is some systems in which we already have an invariant measure. And the problem is to show it's ergodic. And I will introduce a couple of interesting techniques to prove ergodicity of certain measures. So, okay, so section unique ergodicity. And circle rotations. So what is one of the simplest settings in which we know that we have an invariant measure? So if you have um, so we write the circle 
unit circle of, of length one, right, that we've used before. And we're going to prove the following theorem. Let f from S1 to S1 be an irrational circle rotation So there is one measure that we know already that is invariant here. What is this measure that is invariant here? Sorry? Mod 1, yeah, in the circle. What is the measure that is invariant here? What? The what? I can't hear you. The what? Yes, which measure is invariant? The what? What measure is invariant for this map? Do you know one measure that is invariant? Which measure is invariant? What's delta zero? No, f of 0 is not 0. f of 0 is alpha. <laughs> Unless alpha is also equal to 0. What is an invariant measure? If alpha is equal to 0, we have the identity. But alpha is irrational. We assume that it's an irrational rotation. So if alpha, as you remember, if alpha, OK, we need to review a little bit circular rotations, right? If alpha is rational, then every point is periodic. Remember? And then we have the Dirac delta on, on, on the periodic points, OK? But, or the average of the Dirac delta on the periodic points. But if it's irrational, then we have no periodic points. But there is a measure that is invariant for all alpha, both rational and irrational, another measure. A natural measure, an obvious measure, Lebesgue measure. Thank you. OK, Lebesgue measure is invariant because if you take an interval here and you rotate it, you get an the interval here that has exactly the same length. OK, it's invariant. F minus 1 of an interval is, is the same measure. So Lebesgue measure is invariant, both in the rational case and in the irrational case, right? Just translation. So, in the rational case, is it ergodic? In the rational case, it is ergodic? Why is that? Right, right. So if alpha is rational, is the big measure ergodic? What if alpha is 0? Is the big measure ergodic? For example, let alpha equal to 0. f of x equals x, identity map. Is Lebesgue measure, Lebesgue measure is invariant, OK? Is it ergodic? It's not ergodic. You sure it's not ergodic? You can take any, inter any interval here, and it is invariant, fully invariant. And the complement also invariant, and they have measures strictly between 0 and 1. Okay? 
what if x alpha is equal to one half, for example, or one third? Let's say one third. Lebesgue measure is still invariant. Is it ergodic? Why is it not ergodic? Because if you apply F, yes. it has to look like we, we made the translation of this one. Yes. If you take an, uh, an interval with the length is less, strictly less than one, yes. the measure is the same. That's because that's why it's invariant. Yes. Is it ergodic? Of course we can take an interval, but that's not the definition of ergodicity. Yes. It needs to be an interval that is invariant. Yes. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's not ergodic. Why? What's ergodicity? Ergodicity is the definition that if f minus 1 of a equals a implies that mu of a equals 0 or 1. So to show that it's not ergodic, all you need to find is a set that satisfies this. OK, not just any set with measure between 0 and 1, but one that satisfies this. Where's the set? Do you take some neighborhood of stereotype points? I mean, we translate, I will take one neighborhood, and uh, I translate it three times, yes. and I take union of these three. Ah. So you take this interval here, A1. You take the image here, A2. You take the image here, A3. And four iterate counts to A1. Exactly. So if you take A equals A1 union A2 union A3, then it satisfies this condition, right? Because A1 maps to A2, maps to A3, maps to A1. The pre-image is exactly the same. A1 maps to A3, maps to A2, maps to A1, because it's a rotation by one third. OK? So this is a set that satisfies this and does not satisfy that. So it's not ergodic. We found a set that is fully invariant. It's not a connected set. It doesn't have to be connected set, of course. It's just a set of positive measure that's not fully invariant. And you can see that you can do that for any rational number. You can easily do that for what we said is for every rational number, every point is periodic, and they all have exactly the same period. right? If the rational number is p over q, every point is periodic of period q. Okay? So if every point is periodic period q, as long as you take a small enough interval and you iterate it q times, it will come back exactly on itself. If you take it sufficiently small, they will all be disjoint, all these images up to time q, and you will have exactly the same situation as you have here. Okay? Proof. This is a good exam question. This one, right? <laughs> So make sure you understand the argument. <laughs> so if the map is rational, the big measure is not ergodic. OK, we've just proved that. I thought it would be easier to see, so I didn't make a formal statement about this. But. So the question now is if it is an irrational 
rotation. So for an irrational rotation, we cannot use the same argument to prove that it is not ergodic. Because an irrational rotation, however small an interval you take, it will never come back exactly on itself because the points are not periodic. And indeed, we will show that then Lebesgue measure is ergodic. In fact, we will prove something more. We will prove, in fact, the big measure is the unique invariant algorithm. So, what does it mean in terms of the um, distribution of points, the fact that it's ergodic? So, we'll come back to this uniqueness point in a little while because it's very important. So, by Birkhoff's theorem, um, corollary, Um, for the bag, almost every x and um, every and every interval. A, B in S1, we have that 1 over N times the sum So we have that the frequency converges to the Lebesgue measure, right? So if we take an interval, take an interval AB, take a point X, you iterate it, and you wait and see what the frequency of visits to this interval is, then this frequency converges exactly to the Lebesgue measure of AB. Okay, this is a simple consequence of Lebesgue measure, of, of uh, Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. But in fact, we will prove in this particular case, because it is the unique invariant measure, we will prove a stronger theorem. So, so this, this uh, condition we say that x orbit of x orbit of x is uniformly distributed with respect to Lebesgue. Okay, just another way of talking about the convergence in Birkhoff's theorem with respect to uh, characteristic functions. So we will prove the following theorem that says that if f s1 to s1 is an irrational circle rotation, then every orbit is
So this goes beyond Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, right? This says that this property here holds not just for almost every point, which is what you get from Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, but for every point. So the uniqueness is interesting here, and we will study now some general properties to do with maps that have a unique invariant ergodic measure. So we're going to cheat a little bit. So I said that we're going to show that Lebesgue measures are ergodic. Okay? So in this particular case, the way we're going to show that Lebesgue measures are ergodic is by showing that Lebesgue measure is the only invariant measure. If Lebesgue measure is the only invariant measure, why does that automatically imply that it's ergodic? Yes. Yes, also, yes. That's but the uh, M M F is also compact. Yes. Exactly, it's only one point. So we proved before that the set of um, invariant measure is compact, convex, yes. and non empty. And if we prove that it's only one point, and that the ergodic measures are the extremal points, are always non also uh, the set of ergodic measures is always non empty in the case in which the space is compact and the map is continuous, because they're the extremal points of the set of invariant measures. So if we show that Lebesgue measure is the only invariant measure, automatically it has to be ergodic. Okay? So it is also possible to show that Lebesgue measure is ergodic by actually looking at the dynamics directly to show ergodicity. But we're going to do that for a different class of maps. In this class of maps, we're going to take advantage of this property, and we're going to prove that it's the only invariant measure. And that will imply that it's ergodic. And in fact, it implies additional properties, such as this. So having a unique invariant measure is a very strong property of a dynamical system. So let me write this as a general definition. So definition F X to X is uniquely ergodic. if um, it admits a unique ergodic F invariant probability measure. So I put ergodic in parentheses because it follows from the uniqueness of the invariant measures, right? It's not part of the definition, really. It's just that if it's got a unique invariant measure, this measure must be ergodic. So can you give me another example of uniquely ergodic system besides these circle rotations, which we're going to prove now? A simple example that we've seen many times before. What other system can you think of that has only one invariant measure? Maybe You're right, actually. The adding machine has uh, a unique invariant measure. It's related to the circle rotation, but it's not completely obvious to see what this measure is. What about a very simple, a much simpler example than that? Right? So what kind of example? Okay, you can have a constant map that really maps everything to a single point. That's true. And why does that make it uniquely ergodic? 
only the delta at that point. And do you have to map everything to that point? Or can you think of a little bit more general situation that's similar to this one? Sorry? Well, all you need is every point to converge to a unique fixed point. Right? What maps do you know that have this property? <laughs> exactly. Contractions, right? If you have a contraction mapping on a complete metric space and so on, everything converges to a unique fixed point. How do you know that there cannot be any other invariant measures except for the unique fixed point? So if you have some set here, you have your unique fixed point, and you know that everything converges to this fixed point. So this fix, the, the Dirac delta mp is clearly an ergodic invariant measure because we've already said, shown that if you have a fixed point, the Dirac delta on that point is a fixed point. How do you know in this case that there's no other invariant measures? Why? It would have another fixed point. Why? Okay, for example, if we could find some A with uh, condition F minus 1, A is equal to A. Yes. F is contraction in A also. It means that it should have unique fixed point in A. Right. If you had another set of positive measure, or another set that was full invariant and had positive measure, you, it would have to be a contraction on that set. You'd have to have another fixed point. You're, you're basically what you said is correct. Let's try just a slightly simpler way of saying this. Suppose you had another measure that was not the Dirac delta. Then there would be some other set that would have positive measure. It would have to be, right? So suppose you have some set that does not contain P that has positive measure for some other invariant measure. What do we know about this set A? The fact that it has positive measure with respect to some invariant measure. So it's a fixed measure. For some iterates, if you take a point x to a, yes. after some iterates, the points will come. Exactly. After some iterates, the points will come back by Poincare recurrence theorem. Also by Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, because Birkhoff's ergodic theorem will show if this measure is ergodic, and every measure can be decomposed into ergodic measures, so you can assume it's ergodic, and then this will come back infinitely many times. But even without Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, that's right, just by Poincare recurrence theorem, you know that all points will come back. And is this true? Uh, because everything, is everything is converging to P, and A does not contain P, so they do not come back. So there's no recurrence. Okay? So invariant measures are absolutely connected to recurrence. As you can see from the Poincaré recurrence theorem and the Birkhoff ergodic theorem that gives a much more precise quantitative statement about what we mean by recurrence, the frequency of the recurrence. So you can use this fact to understand situations like this and know that if all these points never come back, there can be no invariant measure that is living in that place. And therefore, in this case, this map is uniquely ergodic because it has only one, in a kind of trivial way, right? I mean, this, it's uniquely ergodic in a, in a simple way. But what we're going to show is that circular rotations are uniquely ergodic, and that is much less uh, trivial. Because circular rotations, you have recurrence everywhere. So it's not, certainly not immediately obvious that you have only one invariant measure. So the way we're going to prove it is by a general theorem. So, suppose f x to x is a continuous map of a compact matrix space. And suppose there exists a dense set. Phi 
of continuous functions such that so continuous functions phi x to r such that for all phi in phi there exists a constant phi, sorry, phi bar which depends on phi such that 1 over n the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of phi composed with fi converges to phi bar uniformly. Then F is uniquely ergodic. So there's a, I haven't finished writing the theorem. There's a converse as well. But let's first just think a little bit about what this says and make sure we understand the statement. So you take a continuous map of a compact metric space and you take the space of all continuous functions on x and you suppose there exists a dense subset of continuous functions which converge uniformly to the constant function, right? So notice this, I could write point, I could write x here, but I'm not saying that for each, well, I'm, I'm saying that this converges as functions. This is a family of functions, right? And they converge uniformly to this constant function here. It's a bit like saying that for every x, you converge to a constant, to the same constant uniformly in x. Okay, we have uniform convergence of continuous functions then f is uniquely ergodic. At the moment, there's no reason you should see any connection between uniform convergence and unique ergodicity, but this is what we're going to prove. Let me state the converse also. There's a converse. Conversely, suppose f is uniquely ergodic. Then, for all phi x to r continuous, there exists some constant phi bar that depends on phi such that, so let me call this condition here star, such that star holds. If mu is the unique invariant measure, then phi bar is equal to the integral of phi the mu.
So what's the difference from between this and Birkhoff's ergodic theorem? So here, this, of course, is obvious for the invariant measure, right? For the invariant measure, we clearly have, well, we don't have the uniform convergence. So Birkhoff's ergodic theorem says that this, for every x, this converges to the integral, right? So it's clear that if we have this convergence, it must converge to exactly this for almost every point. Okay, and here we are saying that in fact it converges cont uh, uniformly as a function, which means that it converges for every point uniformly. Okay, so it's a much stronger form of convergence. And this follows from the fact that it's uniquely ergodic. It turns out it's like a strengthening of Birkhoff's ergodic theorem for the specific uniquely ergodic case. Because there's nothing else it can converge to, right? If there were other measures, then these averages would have to converge to other things, but because there's nothing else they can converge to, in some sense, they have to all converge to the same limit, roughly speaking. Okay, so this is the statement. And then we're going to use this statement to prove, we're going to use this part of the statement to prove that um, irrational circular rotations are uniquely ergodic. We're going to find a dense set of continuous functions and prove uniform convergence. And then we're going to apply this to show some strong kind of uniform distribution property for circular rotations. So first of all, let me just make a small remark is that this holds the mark um, theorem also holds for complex valued functions, observables, phi x to c. Okay, this is, this is actually simple. Even in Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, I mean, all these theorems, it's simpler and it's more natural to study for real valued observables. But if you look at the proofs, you see there's no difference, okay? You can do everything for complex valued observables. And we will use this a little bit later on. Um, so maybe before I start the proof of this theorem, let's just take a couple of minutes break and stretch your minds. Okay. Okay. So let's prove this theorem now. So there's two parts. The first part that says that if this happens, it's uniquely ergodic, and the second part, which is the converse. So the first part we're going to split into two lemmas. First of all, we're going to show that if you have this uniform convergence for a dense set of functions, then you have the same uniform convergence for every function. And then we show that if you have uniform convergence for every function, then f is uniquely ergodic. So two easy, well, two conceptually easy steps. And then we would prove the second part of the theorem. Okay, so let's state the first lemma. Uh, under the same assumptions, I won't write them, but under the same assumptions as before, we have a continuous map of a compact metric space. Okay, if star holds for all phi in phi, then it holds all phi continuous. Okay, so let's prove this. It's, a, it's basically just a kind of approximation theorem. So let's write, to simplify the notation, let me write this bn of x phi is equal to 1 over n sum i equals 0 to n minus 1, phi composed with phi of 
x. Okay, this is the averaging that we always work with. And we can think of as a kind of um, uh, av Birkhoff averaging operator in some sense, as you shall see. So, if phi is in phi, okay, what is the assumption? Star says that there exists some phi bar, which depends on phi, okay, such that this is exactly the average, so this is a function such that b, b n of x phi converges to phi bar uniformly in, in the variable x, right, uniformly in x. So now let psi, uh, what did I use, x or m? X, I think, for the space. Huh? X, be continuous, arbitrary continuous function. So we want to show that the same thing uh, is true for X, right? So let epsilon. greater than zero, and choose phi in phi such that, so what does dense, what does it mean to say that this set is dense in the continuous functions? What topology? That's right. Yeah, uniform topology, that's what. You, so in, if we don't specify talking about continuous functions, you always talk about the to see zero topology or the uniform topology. So by the density, what does this mean? This means that we can approximate psi uniformly, right? So there exists phi such that um, the supremum over all x in x of psi of x minus phi of x is less than epsilon. This is what it means that we're epsilon close using the density. Okay, and what does that mean in terms of the bulk of averages of psi? Right? So this means that at each point of the orbit of x, phi and psi are epsilon close. So these errors, the difference between these two is accumulating at the rate of epsilon every iteration, but you're dividing by n, okay? So the average error is still epsilon, okay? So... We have that bn x phi minus bn x psi is less than epsilon for all x and all n because it's uniform. Uniform topology, uniform convergence. And so, since we know that this is converging to phi bar, okay? That means that this is also uniformly close to phi bar. So we have that the supremum over all x n of b n x psi minus phi bar is less than epsilon, okay? And the infimum of xn of bn x psi minus phi bar is also less than epsilon. So does this mean that this bn x psi are converging to phi bar? Sorry?
Is, is this converging to phi bar? Does this mean that these are also converging to the same phi bar? Why not? Because we just proved that uh, the difference between these less than the phi bar. And so? But if we change a silent, then phi bar also changes. Exactly. Very good. OK, so just a remark here. This is not showing that these are converging to phi bar because the choice of phi, of phi depends on epsilon. Okay? But what it means is that this and this are close because they're both close to the same thing for a given epsilon. Okay? And so we have that the supremum over all x in n of b n x psi minus the, supreme, the inf of x n b n x psi is less than 2 epsilon. Since x and since epsilon is arbitrary, and this shows that they can be arbitrarily close, and so they're also converging. Right? So star holds for psi. Okay, so a simple kind of approximation argument to show that that's why we take a dense set and this uniform convergence shows that we can extend it to every continuous function. And now we show that if it holds for every continuous function, so lemma, if star holds for all phi x to r continuous, then f is uniquely ergodic. So why is this term? Why does it imply that there's only a unique invariant measure, unique ergodic invariant measure here? Yeah. Well, let phi x to r continuous. So by Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, we have that 1 over n integral i equals 0 to n minus 1, phi composed with fi of x converges to the integral of phi d mu for almost every So how do we complete the argument here? What is our assumption? What does star say? Remember star? Right. And so? That's right. That's right. So, um, phi bar is equal to integral d mu and 1 over n sum of i equals 0 to n minus 1 phi composed with fi of x 
converges to the integral of phi d mu for all x in x. For every x, it converges to this uniformly. So what was the final observation? If it converges for every phi, sorry, for every point, for every point, the time averages converge to this. Can there be another invariant measure? We're trying to show that there exists only one ergodic invariant measure. So we pick one ergodic invariant measure, and we get this. Now suppose I pick another ergodic invariant measure. Then what? Then I would get exactly the same thing, and you get that for every point, I converge to the integral with respect to a different invariant measure. But this convergence is unique, right? The convergence is unique. You cannot converge to do different things. So that would mean that for those two invariant measures, the integral with respect to every phi coincides, and therefore they have to be the same invariant measure. OK? If, if mu tilde is another invariant ergodic measure, probability measure, then we have that 1 over n i equals 0 n minus 1 of phi composed with f i x converges to the integral of phi d mu tilde for all x and so mu is equal to mu tilde. So this completes the proof of the fact that if you have uniform convergence for a dense set of functions, then the map is uniquely ergodic. Notice that we've used Birkhoff's ergodic theorem in the proof here. OK, so now we want to prove the converse. Suppose that f is uniquely ergodic, then um, then we have the uniform convergence for all continuous functions. Right? So now lemma. Suppose f is uniquely ergodic. So um, Then, for all phi continuous, there exists phi bar such that star holds. So again by Birkhoff, we know that we have this convergence almost everywhere, right? So we know that 1 over n, the sum of phi composed with fi of x converges to the integral of phi d mu for mu almost every x. So let phi bar equals integral of phi d mu, OK? And we want to show that we have actual uniform convergence for all x, OK? And we show that star holds.
So how are we going to show that star holds? How are we going to use the unique ergodicity assumption? What do you think? What's the strategy of the proof? Yeah. We've used Birkhoff's ergodic theorem to choose our constant, right? We want to show that star holds, so we want to show that for every phi, there's a phi bar. So now by Birkhoff's ergodic theorem, we know what this phi bar needs to be. If, if this is going to be true, the only possibility for phi bar is this, because we already know that this converges for almost every point. What we need to show is that this converges uniformly to this. Okay? So how are we going to prove that it's going to be uniformly using the unique ergodicity? So basically, we're going to look at the convergence for other points, and we're going to show that this would be a contradiction. If they converge to anything else, then you must have another invariant measure in there. Right? If we suppose we have a point here for which this uniform convergence does not occur, we can show that this must converge to some other constant that is, gives rise to another invariant measure. So let's try to do that. So what do we need to show? What's the negation of um, uniform continu continuity? So suppose by contradiction, suppose by contradiction, that star does not hold. So what's the negation of, of star? OK, this is not completely. So then the negation is that there exists a continuous function. There exists a continuous function. Uh, there exists epsilon. There exists sequence. sequences xk in x and nk going to infinity such that such that 1 over n sum i equals 0 1 over nk nk minus 1 of fi composed with fi of xk minus phi bar is greater than or equal to epsilon. So how are we going to get a contradiction from this? Well, if you remember how we proved the existence of invariant measures, we took sequences of this kind and we showed that any limit point is invariant, any accumulation point of the sequence. So we're going to do something very similar. Right? Now define the sequence of measures. Nu k is equal to the measure 1 over n sum i equals 0 to n minus 1. So this should be nk. nk of f i star delta in xk. Which is just the same thing by the definition of this is equal to 1 over nk the sum i equals 0. So this should be nk always, nk minus 1, of the delta Dirac in fi of, of xk.
So, then we have for every k, what do we have here? We have the integral of phi with respect to this measure. So what, is, what are we trying to do here, right? So we're trying to contradict. We will show that, in fact, this cannot happen, right? That for any kind of sequences, any choice of points and sequences and so on, because of the uniform convergence, this cannot happen. This is actually converging uniformly to phi bar. This is what we're trying to show, right? So by contradiction, we suppose we find these sequences. So this is for every k, this is greater than or equal to epsilon. So we're going to construct these measures which are specifically built by looking at these times where these averages are far away from the average that you're supposed to have. Right? And therefore, we're going to get a limit of these measures which cannot be the original measure because it's far away from this limit here. And therefore, that's going to prove that there exists another measure. So let's look at the average of phi with respect to this new k. By definition, this is equal to the integral of phi with respect to this measure here. 1 over n k sum i equals 0 of n k minus 1 of delta f i of x. Right? This is this measure. And here I can write this as I can take the sum and the average out, as I've done before, 1 over a k, the sum i equals 0 to n k minus 1 of phi, of the integral of phi with respect to the Dirac delta measures in f i of x. x or x k? x k, thank you. And this is just equal to 1 over nk, the sum i equals 0 to nk minus 1 of, again, remember, when you integrate with respect to Dirac delta, that's just the value of the function at this point. So this is just phi composed with fi of xk. Okay, so by defining the measures in this way, I get that the integral of phi with respect to d, d nu k is exactly this, and this is exactly the uh, Birkhoff average that we had here. Okay, so combining with this, we just get, okay, and so we have that integral of phi d nu k minus phi bar is less than or equal to epsilon for all k. Okay, so remember that this phi bar is the integral of phi with respect to d mu, right? So what are we going to do here? We have a sequence of probability measures here. We can take a limit point, okay? So by the weak star compactness of the space of probability measures, there's a limit point, right? So m, m is compact and... So let um, nu in M such that nu kj converges to nu for some subsequence kj tending to infinity. Then, because of this uniform bound, we have, then we have the integral of phi d nu minus phi bar minus phi bar 
which is the same as integral of phi d nu minus integral of phi d mu greater than or equal to epsilon. Okay, in particular, so we have the nu is different from mu. And how do we know that it's invariant? So arguing exactly as in the proof. Okay. So arguing as in the proof of the Krilov Bogolyubov, 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 <laughs> okay, <laughs> Bogolyubov, theorem. We have that nu is invariant. Okay, but the ergodic averages is F invariant, but for all ergodic components, of no ergodic averages, ergodic. Converge to uh, converge to um, to the integral of phi, which is different from phi bar, and this is a contradiction. Well, it's a con maybe it's like more simply, I could simply say that it's a contradiction because nu is f invariant and it's different from mu from this, and therefore we have a contradiction to the assumption of unique ergodicity. Okay, let me say that actually. It's a little bit simpler to say that. So the contradiction is that nu is f invariant. And nu is different from mu, okay? Contradicting unique evidence. Okay, so today has been quite a technical, quite a technical uh, day. I think we will finish here, and the next lecture we will apply this result to show that the circle rotation is uniquely ergodic, and we will also prove a nice little application to number theory. In ergodic theory, there's a, quite a few applications to number theory, and I will give you some examples as we go along. Some different. Okay, so I think we can finish here for today. Thank you.